Hello again. Time to talk about how to account for the amino acids present in a peptide sequence. All right, so um, the story basically begins with uh, these two fellas, William Stein and Stanford Moore, who um, pioneer the idea of sequencing amino acids in proteins specifically. Um, and to give you an example, for the hexapeptide that I'm showing you right here, uh, the idea was pretty much take your take your peptide, you know, molecule, and expose it to harsh conditions, specifically treat it with concentrated HCl at high temperatures. And what this ultimately does is it breaks down every single amide bond present in your molecule. And another way of saying this is that this allows you to break down the entire peptide into the individual amino acids that were present in that peptide molecule to begin with. So once this happens, then comes the laborious part of separating the amino acids from each other. Uh, and for this, you, you have to use a column chromatography. Although to be most exact, you technically let uh, a high performance liquid chromatograph do this for you, um, also known as an HPLC instrument. The idea um, is still based on chromatography, uh, but yeah, basically you pass your protein mixture, now all amino acids separate from each other, and you pass it through a column that uh, based on the side chains of the amino acids, um, you can actually have different interactions between the column material and the amino acids. You can also change the pH based on the buffer solutions you use. So there's ways to like also alter the interactions. Uh, but the end result is that due to the difference in interactions between the column material and the different amino acids, you have a means of separating them from each other. So right here, I'm just showing you, you know, with uh, as color blocks, each of those amino acids being separated from each other. And then what would happen is that you would simply separate the amino acids and then react them with a molecule known as ninhydrin, uh, shown down here. Now, basically, as the amino acid is collected, um, you will mix it with ninhydrin. And once you mix it with ninhydrin, there will be a reaction that takes place that will turn ninhydrin into a dye um, of you know actual visible color that not only gives you a visible you know a visible cue that yes an amino acid is present but also due to the amount of absorbance of wavelength in this you know in, in the proper color for ninhydrin can tell you the exact amount of amino acid that just came out of the column um, now using an HPLC machine you also have the benefit of seeing at what time is this amino, amino acid coming out of the column? Uh, and by knowing the time of elution, you can correlate that to the specific identity of the amino acid. So this is actually a pretty genius technique, you know, all things considered. And then uh, one more thing I want to say about ninhydrin is that, yes, uh, the solutions you get have a very distinct color, right? You go from being almost colorless to now being like, you know, deep purple in color uh, for the majority of them. Uh, and ninhydrin, in fact, is like so efficient at this reaction that, you know, yeah, you use it basically to, you know, detect fingerprints at crime sites. You know, this is like one of the things that you would do in forensic science. Uh, and yeah, um, this whole thing of checking up the, you know, digital prints, you know, for, you know, perpetrators or individuals is simply because we happen to be excreting a bunch of proteins through our pores, you know, every time we sweat, you know, our, our fingers, you know, our palms, um, we're sweating amino acids. And so we leave the imprint of, you know, how my, you know, how our fingerprints, you know, look like, uh, but this is all amino acids. And then once you have the ninhydrin um, reacting with it, it gives you this, you know, very, very clear, you know, like intense color substance, um, which is the molecule shown down here. So, um, what I want to show you is how that reaction, you know, actually happens uh, from the point of view of a mechanism. So the story starts basically with um, a proton exchange, like all good stories start. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we have that oxygen getting protonated. And once that happens, uh, the other oxygen that did not get protonated has electrons come back down to form an additional carbonyl 
at the expense of that water leaving group, which comes off. So now you have this reagent. Now that reagent is technically an activated carbonyl. So the amino acid sees that and it attacks with its amino group uh, to have the pi bond going back to the oxygen. So you have an amino alcohol. Now here, um, the amine group has still is two protons. So it has a positive charge at the moment. So you have a proton exchange uh, where the oxygen basically takes that proton away and has the electrons going back to the nitrogen. And so now you have created a water leaving group, which the amino group simply kicks out by bringing its electrons down. Right, so then the water takes off and now you have an iminium um, cation present. All right, now here is something very interesting that normally you know you would you wouldn't think really about it, but it's very unique to the amino acids because you have that carboxylic acid present next door. So the moment this iminium ion is formed, you have created a relatively you know high electron withdrawing um, group that wants electrons. You know, it's it's a pretty good electrophile. That's pretty much what I'm trying to say. <laughs> So the carboxylic acid or the carboxylate has electrons come back down over here to the carbon and this allows that carbon-carbon bond to be broken and brought back, at least the electrons be brought back to the nitrogen while kicking away this set of electrons over to the adjacent carbonyl, turning that into an enolate ultimately. Right, so we have this form right here, but the end result is that the carboxylates that we used to have there has been kicked off. It's come off as carbon dioxide. And once that forms, it's gone. It evaporates. Well, it doesn't evaporate. It's already gas. <laughs> it escapes the flask and it's gone. And so this reaction is irreversible. Uh, but you still have a reactive iminium component. And so that iminium component reacts with water to do an addition reaction, kicking the electrons back to nitrogen. You have a proton transfer and the electrons go back to oxygen. And technically you have formed a living group, an amine living group right here. So here is where technically your amino acid gets turned into an aldehyde. So whatever this side chain was, depending on the amino acid that you started the process with, that will now be turned into an aldehyde because this set of electrons will come over to the carbon. The electrons that were part of the carbon nitrogen bond will be kicked exclusively to the nitrogen and you will form an aldehyde. Now the aldehyde will have to be deprotonated at the end, um, but you form an aldehyde of what used to be the amino acid. Now you have generated right here an amine. And an amine that has high electron density because of the enolates that you've also have in this molecule. So a second equivalent of ninhydrin will then react with this amine to bring the electrons back to the oxygen and give you this, um, you know, almost dimeric form. Um, so you'll have protonated nitrogen uh, next to an alcohol or an OH. So you'll basically do a proton transfer, you know, from nitrogen to the oxygen, right? So the electrons of oxygen attack the proton, those electrons that used to be the NH bond go onto nitrogen. And now you have a good water leaving group, which means that your nitrogen lone pair will simply come over next door, form a double bond and kick away that water as a leaving group. And then the end result will be that you will take the proton from your iminium completely off, have the electrons go back to nitrogen, and then you can dump that proton back onto the alkoxy group that you have over here, right? So just remove that proton and then dump it onto the oxygen and voila, you get to the final molecule that gives you all that high coloration, the ninhydrin, you know, like purple, violet, you know, color. So this is how the entire mechanism goes. And, um, you know, I just want you to be aware of that. But there's one more thing to be said about sequencing, and that's something known as the Edmund degradation. Because uh, what I've described to you right now is simply taking an entire oligopeptide or an entire peptide and simply cleaving off all of the amino acids from each other, which is great because you can then separate them and determine how much of them you have and identify them. But now you have no idea in what order they were bound to each other. So Edmund figured out a way to do this 
so that you could only remove one amino acid at a time. And specifically, he does it with the amino terminus, amino acids. Uh, the reagent that he ends up using is um, um, a phenyl thioisocyanate molecule. And you'll see in a second why it happens to be this one with the sulfur. But you do this at a pH of eight, um, follow by addition of trifluoroacetic acid. And the end result is that the first amino acid in the sequence is completely removed and turned into this cyclic product, while the rest of the amino acid is left untouched. So this is one way of like one by one removing those amino acids. Um, and this particular byproduct is known as N-phenolthiohydantoin, <laughs> PTH for short, you know. <laughs> those names can be a little bit painful to say out loud. Um, all right, so once you form that product, uh, this product is the, the final form of the amino acid that can be sent into an HPLC instrument and then analyze to tell you, okay, yeah, you have this particular amino acid, you know, um, at this given time. And it's all based on the retention time. At what time does it come off the column that tells you, you know, what amino acid you had to begin with. But now you're doing a one amino acid at a time. So you will only have one signal in this graph. All right, so let me show you mechanism wise how this happens. All right, so we have the um, phenyl thioisocyanate getting protonated. So we have removal of the proton from the amino acid sequence. And technically that activates the middle carbon in, in, in your isocyanate molecule. So the amine now attacks that carbon and the electrons move over to the sulfur. All right, so now what takes place is that the sulfur ends up attacking the carbonyl of the very first amino acid. So it kind of wraps the entire first amino acid into a cyclic molecule. Uh, and you have to remember the sulfur is a good living group and it's, and if you count the atoms from sulfur to the carbonyl, we have one, two, three, four, and five atoms. So we are gonna form a five member ring that is um, absolutely, you know, favor for formation. So the sulfur will attack that carbonyl, the oxygen will simply take the proton away from the sulfur, and those electrons come back to sulfur to give you the five member ring shown here. Now notice that that carbonyl has been turned into a hydroxyl. Um, notice that uh, you still have the phenyl nitrogen doubly bonded, uh, basically your imine moiety is uh, still present in there, right? And the second amino acid, on the other hand, hasn't been touched at all. All right, so now uh, what happens is that uh, water that's around uh, will simply serve as a means of um, proton exchange. So you will protonate the nitrogen of the second amino acid. You'll produce hydroxide. That hydroxide then removes the proton from your OH component. And that set of electrons simply moves back down to kick out your second amino acid along with whatever else may be bound to it. Um, and you have this initial cyclic byproduct, but the first amino acid is right now completely contained in that cyclic byproduct and has been completely taken out of the chain. So here's where the second reagent uh, comes in. At this point, we finally add trifluoroacetic acid, which protonates uh, your carbonyl. And then what happens is that water attacks that carbonyl, brings electrons back, to oxygen, and we have a proton transfer happening from the water that just came in to the sulfur. So sulfur attacks that proton, the electrons go back to oxygen, you now have a gem diol along with a protonated sulfur. So the electrons of one of these oxygens come back down to form a carbonyl, and in the process, we break open that five member ring. Okay, now here's the key idea. So before we had technically um, thiocarbonate, or excuse me, a thiocarboxylate type of molecule, which is not the best, most stable functional group. So here um, you basically have a little uh, switcheroo type of business because this um, carbon nitrogen bond is free to rotate. And so it will do so, it will rotate. And upon doing that rotation, it will place the nitrogen component of that imine very close to your carbonyl group. And so what will happen is that the sulfur will kick its electrons back down to form a double bond. 
and the pi bond of that carbon nitrogen imine will simply attack the carbonyl carbon next door. Uh, and of course, that pi bond of electrons will simply switch over to the oxygen. So you'll have now a rearranged molecule where now you have a nitrogen, thiocarbonyl, nitrogen components, basically a urea derivative. Um, and then this molecule, you know, simply you remove the proton from that sulfur, have the electrons come back to sulfur, and then you protonate one of these hydroxyls. So the hydroxyl attacks hydronium, the electrons go back to the oxonium, producing water, and you have now a water living group present in this molecule, uh, which the second hydroxyl takes complete advantage of. Um, he brings the electrons back down, kicks away the water. You now have a protonated um, amide in this molecule, and so you can remove that proton with the very same water you just expel. And this gets you to the final product, which is what gets analyzed by your HPLC instrument, right? So then this will be the thing that you pass through your instrument and then you determine, yes, I have this amino acid specifically. So it's a very funky reaction because of the mechanism. Um, you might need to practice it a couple of times just to get it right. Uh, but yeah, this kind of tells you the whole story about how to you know, determine what amino acids are present in your peptide sequence and in what order. All right, so that kind of wraps that up. And in the next video, I'm going to show you how um, to synthesize amino acid sequences, oligopeptides in the laboratory. So catch you in the next video. Bye-bye.